مساء الخير السلام عليكم Good evening Very warm welcome to everyone today Some old faces, new faces <laughs> I think there is echo Before we start uh, Whoever needs translation into Arabic Can raise your hands And we have the Yeah So you have it already Good موجود المايك صوت واضح يا سو ويلكم تو ذوز هو ار هير فور ذا فيرست تايم هوز هير فيرست تايم نايس يا سو از يو نو هارموني هاوس هاز بين اوبريتنج فور ذا لاست 19 ييرز And uh, the aim here is to really promote uh, more peace, inner power, so through different retreats, different uh, speakers, different courses. So uh, welcome, everyone. Today we have special guest, Sister Gopi, who is visiting us on her way to India from the UK. And uh, actually, um, Gopi has a long CV. But I'll try to make it just an essence, <laughs> two lines. <laughs> so Gopi is actually born in Africa, but brought up in the UK. Uh, she started her spiritual journey at the age of eight, uh, being in a family who were already spiritual. So uh, she was really mentored by what we call senior yogis. Um, and now... In essence, she actually travels the world. She's based in the UK, but she travels for certain uh, training programs, mostly also young women empowerment. Uh, there's a very nice program called Choose, Change and Become that she does in Oman with the uh, government there. So, and a lot of, uh, I was just seeing today, like really a lot of um Leadership, actually, programs, yeah. But the whole thing is about empowerment from inside, creating a new society that is based on values. So really, we're very fortunate. And thank you, Gopi, for being with us today. It's a very casual, I mean, you will see it's, uh, today actually is the International Day of Yoga. So as you can see from the title, we said yoga is very important for the body, but also the yoga of the mind. Because yoga means connection, right? Connection with the self, connection with the divine. So we thought it's very accurate uh, that we have Gopi with us today. So thank you so much, uh, Gopi. Good evening. And thank you for coming this evening. Yeah. I know it's like an oven outside. <laughs> so... You know, this evening's title in English, I had suggested was Beyond the Stretch. Because in half the yoga, you're stretching everything. <laughs> right? And, and a, there are two elements in physical yoga that are important. The first element is the stretching, the contraction and expansion of muscles. And the second dimension is breath. And when both of these are in um, harmony, you can sustain lightness in the body, in the feeling of the physical. Right? But sometimes we, we start with stretching and exercising, but the breath isn't under control. Because in Eastern philosophy, we understand that the breath is connected to thought. So it's thought, breath, and activity. And that's why in uh, Sanskrit, the root word for yoga comes from the word yuj in Sanskrit which literally means union. So until you start to integrate 
the power of the mind, with the power of breath, which is the first source of life for the body, and then the power of movement. When you integrate and unionize these three things, then you can get complete self-realization. We society where perhaps um, too much of the physical is overemphasized. <laughs> and very recently, maybe in the last 10 or 15 years, mental well-being, mental health has become very predominant. But people don't know how to resolve that issue. And you can't just get to the mind through your breath and through the body. Because your mind is governed by something else. And before I go into that, I want to tell you a story. I was exposed to the path of meditation with my family who um, came in the mid seventies to learn about yoga and meditation. And I was eight years old when I had my first meditation experience. I was on a mountain top in Mount Abu in Rajasthan. And I had my father, we were five children. I was eight, my brother was seven. I had a sister who was six, another one was nine. And he pushed us in front of these senior yogis. And he said, teach them how to meditate. Now, I remember as an eight-year-old, I couldn't sit still for five minutes. So how were they going to teach me how to meditate? <laughs> so I didn't just have one. I had two of these elder yogis. And they sat on the bed. It's a very simple room. We sat on the floor. And one of the senior yogis said, if you want to learn to be a yogi, a meditator, then you have to learn to look after your mind with love and with law. And the other one then said to me, um, in order to look after the mind with law, you need to learn to discipline the mind. It's like disciplining a little child. And so in my head from childhood, I've always understood the mind to be like a baby. What do you do with a baby? You look after it. Huh? Really precious, you look after it. And if you care for the mind, everything else finds its place. But if the mind is neglected, everything else, it's like a domino effect. And then we work hard in the wrong dimension. <laughs> we try to eat healthier. We try to do more exercise. But the mind is carrying a burden. And the mind is not clean. So the second senior yogi then said, okay, I'm going to give you an exercise to discipline your mind. You have one hour. You go and practice this. This is for an eight-year-old. Okay. So she gives us four questions and she says to us, start a dialogue with yourself in silence with these four questions and do three cycles of this dialogue without your mind wandering off. And if your mind wanders off, you go back to question one again and start again. And you cannot get up until you have completed three cycles. Now, an adult listening to that now would go, that's really difficult. <laughs> but for a child, because you have no contrast, okay, it's a direction. You accept. There's no other belief in place. So I said, okay, went to the meditation room. You know what the four questions were? And by that time, I had enough of an awareness of spirituality and meditation for this to support this dialogue. 
But the four questions were, who am I? <laughs> who do I belong to? Where do I come from? And what am I here for? Who am I? Who do I belong to? Where do I come from? And what am I here for? Now, these are existential questions <laughs> that adults fail to answer. <laughs> but for a child, I didn't think anything of it. It's okay. She's given me homework. And, and she, she said, sit in silence and start the dialogue and let the response come from inside. So I went to the meditation room. I sat down. It was just me and this picture of the light. And I started. Who am I? And as I started that, I could feel myself going into silence. And then an old lady walked into the meditation room and she sat right in front of me. So then from who am I? Who is she? <laughs> You know, suddenly the migrant, and the room is empty and she comes and sits right in front of me. <laughs> okay, we start again. <laughs> I, say, I have one hour to do this. I move to another place in the room and I start. Who am I? Who I belong to? And then a car drives by outside. So like, what is this? And you know, you watch the games of the mind, the monkey mind. Instant distraction. Yeah. You're given a direction, but you can't follow. This is disciplining, right? So then I thought to myself, I cannot continue the next hour like this. Every time there is a noise, my mind gets distracted. I won't even be able to finish one cycle. So I thought to myself, no, I have to do this. And it was very interesting. When the energy of determination is activated, that's when your mind sets. It is the energy of determination that is the seed of disciplining your mind. You can't discipline your mind in a vague way. You have to start with, and that was one of my first lessons. If I want to achieve success in any methodology, I have to Activate determination in my mind. So then I thought, I have to do this. And it was like all my faculties concentrated. And I started the dialogue. And by the time I got to the second cycle, and it was just taking me into such a deep place of peace and this feeling like I was, I was connected to something beyond me. beyond this body, this costume, this role, this mask. And by the time I reached the second cycle, my consciousness just shifted to another dimension. And it was just light, bliss, deep silence. And I must have been sitting like that for 45 minutes. And it felt like two minutes when I opened my eyes. And I remember that was my first experience of touching myself beyond this identity. Beyond someone's daughter, beyond someone's friend, beyond someone labeled. This beautiful being, wow, this beautiful feeling, this is me. And once a child touches anchors there, your life changes. Because suddenly you start to live life from the inside out. I, I developed a much more refined sense of what is true and what is false. I knew instinctively. Nobody had to teach me this is right and wrong. You just instinctively know. Because what gets activated in meditation is the purest feelings inside. It's your purity that gets activated. Your purity is your originality. 
Your purity is your authenticity. Right? It's that thing that makes you you. And that's what gets activated. And when your filter, all your subtle filters, when you touch that source of purity inside, it affects every function inside, subtle function. So the filter of discernment, much finer refined filter, the filter of feelings in your mind, all of that starts to take on a higher level of operation. You perceive in more subtle ways. You feel more subtle things. So instinctively, I started to just live my life from the inside out because I started to practice regularly. This worked for me. If something works for you, you practice. And even growing up later on, yes, you know, I went through school, I was studying law. Even through meetings, big projects, the first thing I used to do is just recenter. It doesn't matter what the role is, what the project is, what the dynamic is, I recenter back into my dimension. So I very quickly understood from a young age that in order to be impactful at a physical level, and that could mean anything from looking after your health to sustaining harmony in your relationships to being effective in whatever you do. You needed to start from the mind. You needed to start from your sense of self. If you don't shift your awareness, that is the source of your power. And if you, you don't shift your awareness away from the material and the physical to the spiritual, then where, are you, where is your source of power? You are controlled by what you are aware of. So without spirituality and meditation, we have our plugs plugged into many different sockets. This person, this food, this diet, this we're supported by many dimensions. And COVID challenged that because COVID forced you to take your plugs out because there were some things you could not do, people you could not be with. Then who are you? The whole, that whole global phenomena was an invitation for people to come restore balance, to get a sense of self-awareness. Who am I if I'm not with this person? Who am I if I'm not this one's mother? Who am I if I'm not a businessman? <laughs> Who am I beyond these roles? And that's why today's topic was beyond the stretch. <laughs> Who's the one that's making the body stretch? <laughs> Because when you stay in that awareness, everything from that point on is in your control. Does that make sense? When you let something else into your awareness, you quite literally give your power away. That's what happens. Now, many times I get asked the question, Sister, how can you be spiritual in a world like this? It's so difficult. It's so stressful. <laughs> this is not for us. I mean, this is really high stuff. Okay. Right. And how do you sustain meditation? <laughs> and what I've understood over time are two principles. One is wherever your attention goes, your energy will flow. So if you pay attention to something, cultivating something, your energy starts to grow in that direction. Now, people think it's difficult to pay attention to self-awareness and be in the world. It's not. 
Mothers do it all the time with their babies. They have the baby in one arm. They're cooking, cleaning, going shopping. There's at no point does a mother say, oh, I got so absorbed in what I was doing, I forgot I had a baby in my hand. Oh, I dropped the baby. Oh, I didn't realize I would have a baby in my hand. There's one eye always on this precious thing. As you're doing everything else, we all have this function. But we don't exercise this ability inside us for ourselves. Because you can't see yourself, right? Not a physical thing. But you, your mind is like a baby. You're not just going to throw it in a trash can. You're not just going to let it touch dirty things. So one eye on whatever is happening outside is fine. But one eye on this little baby to make sure it doesn't get caught up in anything too much. That's one thing, attention. The second thing is that when you become aware of yourself as a spiritual being, very there is a frequency of energy that shifts. The material and physical energy frequency is very up and down, up and down, up and down. It's what we call in English erratic. And there's a lot of noise at that level. Everybody's thinking about house, clothes, car, family, people. There's a lot of data at that frequency. So if you imagine a radio station, and a radio station has several frequencies, right? There's 99, 105, 102. But if you're tuned in at 105, can you hear what's happening at 99? There you go. And if you're tuned in at 99, can you hear what's happening at 105? There you go. That's the principle of frequency. That's what meditation does. The moment you switch frequency, you immediately cut out the noise. You just don't register it. It doesn't end because you're not at that frequency. Even today, science is starting to support this. Science is now telling us that when you wake up in the morning, what you think and feel in the first 15 minutes of waking up sets your mood, the frequency of your mood for the whole day. So, when we start to build a lifestyle where we tune at the beginning of the day, then it's like cruise control. Press the button and you just cruise. It doesn't matter. Things will happen. This is life. It's a jungle of thorns. Somebody will go, Tip. something will go wrong, something. It's like that. But you know what it's like when you're in a good mood? It's okay. You stay buoyant. You stay light. Okay, but when you're in a bad mood, everything sticks. Why did this person look at me like this? Why did they say this to me? It's like you become hypersensitive, right? That's the lower level frequency. You're at the frequency of the physical and the material. So anything anybody says or does, it goes right in. So this is very careful tuning that has to happen at the beginning of the day. Unfortunately, in our society, this wonderful 13-inch contraption dominates our morning. <laughs> right? Who wakes up in the morning and reaches straight for their mobile phone? <laughs> exactly. And I'm saying... Have the disciplines to stay away from it for half an hour. So when you wake up, you're in charge. You haven't plugged your mind into a thousand social feeds as soon as you wake up. Because you will not be in control of your day and you will not be in control of yourself in the day after that point. 
So this aspect of the shift of awareness, it's like a switch that we have to keep making every day. Now, before I continue, I'm going to invite you into an activity. Will you join me? It's very simple, but I need you to follow my directions. Is that okay? Okay. So I would like you to get up and sit down three times, please. Thank you. If you had your exercise, okay? <laughs> no. Okay, now what I'd like you to do is both feet on the floor. I'm going to take you into reflection. And for a few moments, I'd like you to visualize a very soft, warm, goldeny orange light around your feet. It's a very warm light. And it penetrates the muscles in your feet and your legs. And it starts to soften and relax all the muscles, soften the tissues. It creates space inside. And this beautiful light travels up your legs, surrounding your thighs, your knees, your hips, your stomach. Gently penetrating the skin, softening all the tissues, relaxing the muscles. And then this light travels up in your chest, down your arms. It's a very warm, soothing, golden orange light. And it's softening everything, relaxing everything. And then it travels up your neck into your brain. And again, this light releases any tension And for a few moments, you are embraced in this warm, golden, orange light. Now, just take a deep breath slowly and hold it. And then release it slowly. And again. Deep breath in, hold it, and release slowly. And one more time, deep breath in, hold it, and release slowly. As you allow your breathing to settle into a gentle rhythm, Become more present in this moment now. Your breath focuses you here and now. And as you start to experience a sense of calmness and peace. 
Just be aware of your breath and follow it to its source. Become aware of the very subtle power and energy inside. that is making you breathe. It's making the blood move in this body. It's listening through these ears. It's a deep intelligence. It's very light. And now visualize all that power concentrating, rising up and concentrating behind the eyes. Into an essence, a star of light. And now, from this seat of being an observer behind the eyes, you are in the command position. And now I would like you to repeat that same activity, getting up and standing down. But each time you do so, you will choose to do it from this command position. And so you will say to yourself, I, the inner being, choose to stand up. You stand up. I, the inner being, choose to sit down. You sit down. So make it a conscious process and get up and stand down again three times. Just come back to your command position again as you sit down and open your eyes. Thank you. So what difference did you notice between the first time you got up and sat down and the second time? Speed. What was different in the speed? First time was quick, yeah, just get up and sit down. First one was, um, was slower. The first one was? Automatic. Automatic? Yes. I felt my body was not connected. It was to sit over no control. It's very heavy. And I am very light and I can go, but without my body. So that the first experience was? Well, that the second experience, right? That even if your body felt heavy, you felt light enough to stand up and sit down. I, I I can do it. You can do it. Without my body. Yeah. Who's in control? Yeah. <laughs> yes. I just make her stand up for you. Second. First one, she stands up for me. <laughs> second, I stand up for my Second, I stand up for myself. It's a completely different experience, isn't it? 
following a command from outside and then actually choosing and you're in charge then. It doesn't matter what, same command. I commanded you at the beginning and I commanded you again. But the second experience was your choice, which meant who's in control. Yeah. What else? Yes. Somebody wanted to share? Yeah. Yes. Okay, so the first time you felt you were forced to do it. Yes. It was your choice. And there was more willingness. Yeah. Even though I'd invited you, I'd requested, would you, can I do an activity with you? And some of you said yes. Because you had to. It was like an invitation that came with a tag. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Okay. You're more focused. I just need to repeat what you're saying because translation is happening. The first time you did it because everybody was doing it. How much do we do that in life? Oh, well, everybody's going that way, so let's go that way. <laughs> and the second time was at your pace. More focused. And more focused. Okay. Anyone else? Yes. First one was like a mechanical movement. The first one was like a mechanical movement. The second time was floating. Uh, more graceful. It's almost as if you're not even aware you're doing the movement. So this is the experience beyond the stretch. Micro shift. It's a little shift. Understand? This is the transition from ordinary to extraordinary. From out of control to in control. From codependency to independent and interdependency. <laughs> and so, you know, when we, in our human lives, we, we feel helpless to certain people, certain situations, certain events, because whatever we get from outside, there's no filter. We don't have our self-awareness in place. So you just take rubbish. Are you a dustbin? You're walking around, if without self-awareness, you're walking around like a dustbin. And that's exactly what then creates all the resistance. Do I have to do this? I don't want to do this. I don't like being told what to do. <laughs> you're constantly resisting and you're not learning. So this shift, when you start to become self-aware, puts you back in the driving seat. And if I am doing something because it's my choice, is there anybody left to blame? No. But in the first instance, maybe for some reason, you know, it's, it's, this was like a micro activity, a microcosm of what happens in your life. There's people around you, especially family, society that have expectations, demands. Right? And when we don't have a filter, we feel pressured by those demands, obliged to do that. Oh, well, they're doing it, so I have to do it too. Well, actually, maybe no, I don't. Or even if I have to do it, I'm not going to do it because they're doing it. I'm going to do it because I have made the choice. So reclaiming power at any level, physical, 
spiritual, mental, you have to make this shift of awareness. You have to make the choice. Because I made the choice, I'm responsible. I own my life. I own the experience of what is happening as a consequence of my choice. And that's the only time that you can move beyond pain. When you accept responsibility. Many times we have performed, we have done things in our life not from a place of self-awareness and not from a place of having made the choice. So the feeling of something's been done to me stays. And that's pain. And until you come to a place where you make a choice, you cannot let go of pain because you feel somebody is responsible for the way you feel. And that's not true. I gave the same direction twice. You had a different experience with the same direction. So who does the feeling? You. So until we start to realize nothing is being done to me, it's what I'm doing with it here that's making the difference. Yeah, absolutely. And the reason why people's pain turns to suffering, because they haven't made the choice. But it continues and continues and continues and continues. And eventually, you know, Imagine basic, I'm going a little bit back to basics here, but this is the root and the foundation of self-empowerment and integration. Imagine when we eat, for example. This is something we do every day. Now, you can be eating the best quality food but if your awareness is somewhere else, do you think your body cells are absorbing it? Sometimes you're eating the food, you're thinking about what you have to do tomorrow. You're eating your food, you're thinking about your business. You're worrying about this, you're worrying about that. Wherever, whatever your attention goes, your energy flows in that direction. So in this moment now, your full energy is not available for digestion to happen for the cells to open, for saliva to be produced, for the enzymes to start their work. So it doesn't matter how brilliant your food is, because your awareness is somewhere else, you've just shut down your ability to receive nutrition from that food. That's when people get health conscious <laughs> because they're just not being attentive. And then everything is a compartment in life. Oh, I have to take care of the food. I have to find a nutritionist to take care of the food, take care of the body. And you start compartmentalizing your whole life. And then you're running around like a little hamster. <laughs> ah, balance, I've got to do this and then do this. And really, really busy. I have a busy day today. But what's coming out of that busyness? More stress. Not more contentment and more peace. So all of our activity in a day happens from a place of dissonance. You know what dissonance is? Where you are not present with what you do in the right awareness. I am choosing this. Even with food, when you go back into that awareness and you choose what you eat, you will eat less and you will eat the right things. Otherwise, this thing that is two inches long controls you. Because if you're not eating from a place of self-awareness, you are eating from a place of dissonance, disconnectedness. And some form of emotion will fill that gap. That's why 
emotional states are con connected with overeating. This doesn't matter how much you eat, it's never enough. Because you're trying to fill the gap that you've created. So, you know, what we understand and what I have understood in life is life is simple. It's one. But I have to stay one inside. So whatever I do, I'm in command. I choose. I made the choice to eat ice cream this evening. I ate a little bit extra than I should have. I can feel it in my stomach. I made that choice. Okay. Now I'm not going to suffer for it. Yes, my stomach is going, hey, two spoonfuls less would have been good. <laughs> but the extra two spoonfuls just tip the balance. <laughs> so your body lets you know how much it needs to move. And you know, it doesn't need a lot. Because even food is vibrational data. It's information. Everything functions in this world on information. So you just need a little of that vibrational data to activate your functions. But when you are disconnected from yourself and you're not in the command position, then it's like gorging. And that is the seed that disconnect and that dissonance is the seed of disease, dis-ease. And then we try harder at external levels to become healthy, but nothing works. When actually you go back to the root and it's a micro shift, it has to take place. It is, it is one of the most liberating experiences in my journey. I have handled multi-million euro projects people from all cultures, backgrounds. But because I have this practice and I choose what I go into, I'm in charge of my experience. And that means I never let myself become a victim to anyone. Nobody. Because the reality is what? The reality is, and I was sharing it this morning, that we are never defeated by a person or a circumstance. We're only defeated by what we want from it. That's it. So the currency and the game we played in our relationships is expectation. You do this for me, I do this for you. You do this for me, I do. Transaction. Okay? That's the currency and that's the contract we've written right now. The moment you cancel that contract and you say, I am back in my seat, I have certain values and principles on the basis of which I choose, you will get pushed back. Because you are standing up. You are reclaiming your sovereignty. You're not playing the game. You understand? This will create resistance. Yeah. What about naming yourself? So, well, here's the thing. The question is, what about blaming yourself if you've made bad choices, right? One of the dynamics of these games in relationships when you have signed a transaction with someone. See, a promise and a commitment is different. You uphold a promise. You know, it's, it's your, your, lo your loyalty. Your, you're doing it because you made the promise. But the transaction is like, I give this much, you give this much. It's like a... One of the dynamics of that is if you don't give me this, you feel guilty. This one gets upset because I didn't give them this, or I have to give them this much to make them feel happy, then I'll be okay. It's like an illusion. 
of dependency that begins. That in order for me to be okay, I have to make sure I keep this one and this one and this one and this one okay. And you are at the bottom of the list. <laughs> and then the, what's the reality? Are they ever okay? Oh. No. No. <laughs> I mean, how many times have you done things to please people in your life and they've never appreciated it? Every day. <laughs> because you're missing the point. You're playing a game. And in that game, you compromise, they compromise. Nobody happy. So when you stop playing the game and you start saying, okay, what is it I want to uphold in this relationship? It's just you have to make a decision. Yes, the connection is there. Well, we're, we're in, we are an interdependent society. We cannot live without each other. It's your ego that thinks you can live by yourself. Huh. What do you mean live by yourself? Even the house you you live in is not built by you. Even the chair you're sitting on, you don't own. We use this word my so loosely. But what is yours? Tell me. What is yours? Nothing. Nothing. But you know how deep human nature is in terms of my? Like you're sitting in this chair now, right? You're comfortable, right? Okay. So one of you is going to get up and go to the bathroom. Maybe a few of you will go to the bathroom. And then you come back. Where will you come back to? You've been sitting here for 45 minutes. You'll come back to the same chair. And if somebody else is sitting in that chair, oh, who's sitting in my chair? <laughs> All right. You sat for 45 minutes and it's become your chair, hey? Where does the disturbance begin? The mind. mind. So this is the transaction element. Huh? And that's what creates the upset. Because the ownership is being broken. I don't own you. You don't own me. And that creates the upset. But that's healing. Like they say, illness erupts because it heals. So it's okay. Because if your principles are right and the choices, the, the basis on which you are operating is resonance, it will fix itself. This movement, where, when we began Raj Yoga in the late 1936, in the movement of the Brahma Kumaris in India, this was a revolutionary movement in the mid-30s. Against the backdrop of this movement beginning was the Gandhi revolution, the resistance, civil disobedience against suppression. And then in comes this one man, Dada Lekraj, who was a jeweler in a very affluent society in Sindh. And he started getting visions of transformation, of the light, God is light, visions of the new world, visions of the transformation. And he realized something deeply needed to be changed in society. And he took a bold step and he created an administration and he put women at the front in a climate where women had no legal rights and no education. Oh, this upset society a lot. Yeah. There were court cases. But the amazing thing about truth is always victory. And those court cases started to change the landscape of women's rights in India. After some of those court cases, women could start keeping their dowries. You know how they come into a marriage with a dowry? And if the husband died, they lost everything. The law then passed in favor that if your husband dies, or if you, you keep the dowry. So slowly, 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 the landscape of women's rights started changing in India. So, you know, anything where you start to live a life of what we say, self-sovereignty. 
making that shift back to command position, you will start to challenge the, uh, the network of games. <laughs> but I think that when you really have an honest conversation with your heart and you really stay true to yourself, then God is your companion because God is truth. And when you walk a path of truth and remaining true, it is not possible that God cannot help you. Because that resonance is a deep spiritual resonance. That light is completely pure, completely true, completely benevolent and merciful, full of everything. When you start walking the path of truth, that light supports and guides that's been my experience. You just need to stay courageous. Don't give in. And don't let go of your seat. Yeah, and then fall into your reactivity. <laughs> okay. Helpful? Yeah. Okay. So it's five past seven. Do you have any questions? Yeah, I have a question. Um, when you mentioned the, the frequency and, and you need to get the other frequency, but I think 74 a bar, like I tried to do that and suddenly everything changed completely in a, in a bad way. It started to come back up. Is this normal? Yes. Uh -huh. You know, this is how it works. When you have been operating at a certain level of power, you build your life around that, that type of power. Mixed. You understand? You build your life around it. When you change your power source, of course this gets dismantled. It happens in agriculture. We have in, in India at our headquarters... We have something called yogic farming, where they are now actively using the power of meditation to affect nature. And everything is built, even the fertilizers is organic. And it's a slow process, but it's yogic farming that helps yield better quality crop, but also replenish the soil quality. Okay. Now, it's very interesting. What we've noticed is that where organizations have adopted yogic farming and they've moved away from traditional agriculture practices of fertilizers, pesticides, there is a period of time where there is a loss. And then after that, the gain is triple because it's the unplugging that's happening, right? That's all it is. It's just an unplugging and you're changing to a different power source. And then what you're building is fruitful and is benevolent for everyone. And that's what's happened. We've seen this in the yogic farming. It happens with nature. There's a period of loss, and then the government com compensates because they know, but they're encouraging farmers to go into organic farming because they know that this is the only way we will be able to save our soil quality and create healthy food for people that isn't poisoning them. Yeah, but... Some farmers who are attached to the quick fix and the money. It's like, no, I, this is what, what I know. I don't want to move from this. But the farmers that have the courage to do this, amazing. Those farmers with half an acre of land are earning more than enough than they need to feed their families. And we have amazing success stories from them. So, yes. This does it. Anyone else? There's one at the back. Hi. Hello. Is this working? Yeah. Okay, I'll just speak um, loud to you. Is it? Yeah, that works. Okay. So uh, you said something about uh, 
choosing or making a choice uh something that like suits you a conscious one but what if your choice like you did what uh you, you took it how can i say that but like you made the choice that suits you but other people around you didn't like the choice you make you made or you took welcome to life yeah so um how am i supposed to deal with that in a like uh, you know work you, way here's something you need to desensitize yourself to which is the human nature of commenting on everything if you move forward somebody will go why are you moving forward yeah okay and then you stop and you go back and then somebody will say why are you going back okay stop? and then somebody and you stop and then somebody will go why did you stop you can't get away from it it is the nature of the environment yeah but hold on a second let, let me separate yeah but that's the point is the point is is your belief that you have to please someone this is the environment it's the terrain just understand it as an environment and then what that starts to do is when you make the choice you have to tolerate it it's and you know people will make a comment one day right they don't mean anything and then they go on and live their lives and they forget about you huh or copy you eventually but they won't tell you they copied you so the point is people don't care it's just human nature now if you have a mission to try and make sure everybody likes you you will suffer i don't want to make everyone like me yes but there's another another thing you said that i find like i find the problem like grasping the both concepts is um you don't have to please everyone and you're not alone in in and you can't you're not alone in life we're an inter and that goes back society to the basis on which you are making your choice and that has a lot to do with understanding your value system on what basis are you making a choice for most people especially now and it's gotten worse people's choices are not on the basis of values they're on the basis of material gain what's mm -hmm. convenient what's useful what's easy there's no values there's no principle choices happening anymore because when you have a values based choice it is beneficial for yourself and the other even if they can't see it so you have to be very deeply clear why you're doing what you're doing and when you're clear about why you're doing what you're doing then it's about communicating it gently okay. and peacefully can you give an example yes i was studying law at university i'd been given entrance into oxford university my family was elated oh she's going to go study in oxford education is a big thing for our communities and uh, my sense was something wasn't right. I went to Lady Margaret Hall. I went to see the campus. And the way the Oxford University system works is it's not about classes and lessons. You get a personal tutor. If you miss the classes and lessons, it's okay. But you can't miss the sessions with this personal tutor. And I met this person. And I didn't resonate with this person. And I, I really just had to quietly sit down and make an assessment to think, I have to give four years of my life to this. Yeah, I'm not quite comfortable with the res. I'm not the setup. The course isn't quite something. So, okay. And there were certain principles I had in mind, which was, you know, I was a meditator. I wake up at four in the morning. I have a diet. I have a vegetarian diet. Um, so I need some space. I need to make sure that's anchored for me to 
do what I have to do. And that those needs weren't being met there. So it wasn't just about the course, but it was those core needs. So after I assessed everything, I made the choice. I'm going to refuse this offer. You can imagine the reaction from my family. Are you crazy? <laughs> People give their lives to get into this university and you're refusing this. Are you mad? My grandfather was one of them. My mother was one of them. My father's pretty cool. But um, yeah, it was the first sign. And I've had to very patiently, because I didn't feel I had done the wrong thing. I felt I had been honest with myself. And that made my conscience very peaceful. And so then I could just say, this is how I felt. And then slowly my mother could understand even though she didn't like my choice, but she could understand it. So that was the first road of compassion, being able to share it. And then I actually enrolled at the University of Sussex, which was five minutes by car from my home. Okay. And it was a more modern course in law. And I had a chance to study a language with it. And you wouldn't believe it, two years into the course, I suddenly started to develop disinterest in it. I thought, I can't see myself finishing this. Why? There's something that's going happening inside me. And I thought, and you know, I had taken a year off to do work experience. I had shadowed a CEO of a criminal law firm to get on ground experience that if I'm going to spend my life in this profession, I need to know what's going to happen on the ground. So that was my first exposure to the volume of negativity in the world, eh? criminal cases. And in the mornings, you know, you come on the desk and there's a pile this high of cases that you have to study, memorize, go into the court. And I saw the ground reality. I saw the reality of being discriminated because I was a woman. I saw the attitudes. I saw that the decisions went where the money lay. So on the surface, this is supposed to be a system that protects. But when you get to the roots, you see there's a lot of stuff that's not right here. And one day after my meditation, I had to do a, I had to rethink this. Because if already now I was starting to see this stuff, and I wasn't coping very well with it. What would happen to me if I actually went into this profession? So I remember. Okay, I've completed my degree. I've done everything. What do I look like five years down the line? I saw somebody that was incredibly successful, wealthy, top of the game, very effective. But deeply unhappy. Because A, I would have had to compromise something to get there. And I wasn't ready to make that compromise. And I had to eat humble pie. Because I realized in that moment, I don't have enough spiritual strength at this point to combat this negativity. It will eat me up or I will end up fighting it. And that's the same energy. And you can never cancel something with the same energy. And that was my deep realization about my state. And you know, you need to shift something here completely. And at that point, I decided to leave university. Again. <laughs> yes. I have never looked back since. I mean, look, everything's available for you when you want it. But what I had to honor was being honest to myself, honest to my conscience, honest to my karmic story. I came home and I said, Dad, I remember one day I woke up and it was very clear for me, today you leave. I got up, got in the car, 
drove to university, walked into the dean's office and said, excuse me, I'd like to take a year off. Actually, I was planning to leave. And he looked shocked. You can't. You're doing so well. And I said, this is important for me. I need to reconcile something inside before I step further. And he said, one moment. And he went out of the office and he called my mother. <laughs> <laughs> oh, he really well, called home. And my mother picked up the phone, the last of the people to pick. Anyway, and then he comes back in and he tries to convince me. And I said to him, I said, look, I really appreciate your, your support. I really appreciate, I know your feeling of wanting me to progress and you think, but you have to trust me on this one because either you give me this permission now or I send you a resignation letter because the choice is mine. And then he was very sweet after that. Um, not any, okay, fine. <laughs> because I've made it very clear to him, the choice is mine. Huh? I'm just being polite and asking you, but this choice is mine. And then I went home. And when I went home, I didn't know my mother had known already. But the first person I met was my father. Thank you. And you know, he, is, he was, he passed away last year. He was the coolest person in the world. I have never, ever seen this soul get angry in my life. It's a real instrument of God, I tell you. And I'm just talking. I said, Dad, this is what I saw. This is what I felt. This is what I'm thinking. I'm not sure what the future holds, but I have faith in myself and I have faith in life and I know everything will work out. And he's just patiently listening to me. And after 20 minutes of my rambling, he just looks at me and he says, the most important thing in your life is your happiness. Whatever choice and decision you make for your happiness, I will support you. Can you imagine when you hear that, it just brought me right back into myself, into peace. He didn't give me a reference point of, if you don't study, how are you going to grow up in life? Where are you going to earn your money from? What are you? Those are all limited references. He brought me right back to the reality of quality of life. And I just became so peaceful that I had the courage to go and face my mother. <laughs> and she already knows, right? So she's got her guard up. <laughs> oh, yeah. she's My mother's a firecracker. My father, very peaceful. Mother's a little bit of a firecracker. And so she's waiting for me. And I can see something in her eyes, so she knows something. And I said to her, Mom, you and dad have been so instrumental in my life for making the choices that have brought me to where I am today and for making me the person I am today. So I thank you very much for that. But I'm at a point in my life where I'm ready to make my choice and I'm ready to own the consequences of my choice. And I feel this is the right step for me. <laughs> and you know what? I really feel quite strongly about this, but if you and dad really, really feel that what I'm doing is wrong, if you're a hundred percent convinced that what I'm doing is not right for me, I'm ready to do whatever you want. Yeah. Well, it was just natural because I was so secure in my choice. I just said, okay, if you're completely 100% convinced that what you want is the best thing for me, I'm ready to try it because I've lived like that. I trust you on one condition. If tomorrow I die, you should have no regrets about the choice you made. And you should have no regrets about not letting me do what I wanted to do. If you're ready, if you feel that your choice is 100% right for me, and you will not have regrets about it later, I'm ready to do what you want. 
she stopped talking to me. <laughs> she just went quiet. Because she knew in that moment, she didn't like what I was doing because it didn't fit the norm, but she didn't have the strength to make a choice for me. Hello. Yes. Is that online? <laughs> yeah, I have a question. Yes. I, I have have to, but so yes. Can you hear me? Okay. I lost. So you you yes. you said you were you were saying that uh, when you started working, you faced some negativity and things that not like negative. Okay. So uh, my question is, how can we differentiate between our perception? like our frequency that we're tuning our head with our thoughts and what's really happening. Like when, when can we know that this is an outside negativity and when if can we you are, out- When you are in a material and body conscious frequency, you can't differentiate. Okay. Because all that data is at that level. It's very difficult to differentiate. Other stuff, other people's stuff from your stuff. Because it's all in one frequency, all that information, and there's a lot. You know, people's fears, people's, it's in the atmosphere. And when you're in a body of conscious frequency, it will affect. And then that's where the lines get blurred. But when you have a practice of meditation, and especially early morning meditation, and you're switching frequency, then even when you're met, you know who you are and you know what you're not. You know when something is coming, it's not yours. So you can, no, this is not me. Okay. So this happens when you increase that practice of self-awareness first thing in the morning. <laughs> Last question. So now you like done your meditation, you go like, have a great day at work and then you constantly bombard it. Can I just give you the mic yeah. because there's a translation happening sure. and then we need to close. Like you're constantly bombarded with negative energy or, you know, people complaining about their day. And as much as you're in a higher state, you get affected by that. They're constant complaining and maybe you try to like ease it out and then you get affected by the end. Of, like I always find myself in the beginning of the day, like really yeah. High energy and okay. So, you know what I do in situations like this because I'm with different people all the time. Yeah, I manage my timetable really well. Yeah, I have things to do and I I'm light in my relationships. I'll say hello, hello but I won't go too deep. Mm-hmm. You understand? I won't hang out with. I'll do this. I'll I'll acknowledge and I'll give them my my sun, my sunshine. <laughs> but I'm not about to go under their cloud. (laughs) So this, I manage myself very well in these relationships. Do what you have to do and then move. Don't linger. So you have to manage your time and your timetable. Well, what if this person's physically right in front of you, like the whole day? (laughs) Keep taking coffee breaks. (laughs) Yeah, just get up and move. Move. Don't stay in that cloud. You just get up and move. You know? You, you need to. You can't. You stay under a cloud too long, It's you're going to start raining on you. So, yeah. And then you might need to, if it if it's too much, you might need to request your CEO to move desk. <laughs> but you have to take these precautions, right? It's like you take precautions for your health. You won't eat food that's bad for you. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much for being such an engaging audience and for following my instructions <laughs> so much. So let's have a few moments in meditation. So I'm going to ask you to sit upright. <clears throat> Once again, Just visualize this light, golden, warm, orange light by your feet, your legs, 
your lower body, upper body, arms and hands. And this light softly moves, softening, warming, relaxing everything. And then you become aware of your breath. Just breathe in slowly, hold it, and then breathe out slowly. And with each breath you take in and out, bring your attention into this moment now. Past is the past. The future hasn't happened. And let your breathing settle into a gentle rhythm. And now follow your breath again to its source. Feel yourself inside a living, thinking, being of energy. Master of this body and all its functions. Very subtle energy. And you allow this energy to concentrate behind your eyes. Into a star of light. Now, I'd like you to generate this pure thought three times in your mind. And each time you repeat it in your mind, surrender to the experience of it. I, the inner being, The being of light and the peace. 